morning, church. We are so glad you're here to worship with us this morning. And for those visiting with us, we're glad you're here as well. Uh, this morning, we are continuing on our series. We've been in this series for a couple months talking about um, living as one, the community of faith as Christians. What does it mean? What does it look like to live in community with other believers? How does that work? You know, Scripture says we're the bride. We collectively are the bride of Christ. We are the body of Christ. We do all this stuff together. So how do we actually function together as a body? And that's what we've been going through. And this morning, we're going to look at a topic that's really, really fun. Isaac had a good time picking songs that fit this, but we're talking about discipline and community. It's, it's, it's fun, right? Uh, but we, we want to look at this. Now, I know, like, I saw a bunch of you just get out your notebooks. You're like, he's going to give us all the dirt. Um, no, we're not going to be talking about any specific things that have happened in our church throughout its history. But we are going to look at Scripture and, and see what does Scripture say about this. As we live together as a community, just like a family, there are times where something needs to take place in terms of discipline. If you've had children or if you've been a child... I think we all fit in there. You've probably experienced discipline in some way. Parents, all parents do it a little bit differently, but at some point, I'm sure you did something that you needed to be disciplined for. My kids never have yet. Um, but so we're going to look at this from a biblical perspective and understand what, is, what does Scripture say about we as Christians living in community together? How does discipline fit into that? And so we're going to start by looking at a passage from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And this is going to help us understand what the standard is. You know, Patrick shared with us that scripture that says we, you know, we're holy. If we're in Christ, we've been made holy. But out of that holiness that comes not from anything we've earned, but from the Holy Spirit living in us and the sacrifice of Christ, out of that holiness should come holy behavior and conduct. And so when, when a follower of Christ strays from that, then typically something needs to be done. And, and so here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we get a picture of uh, what the, the standard is. And here's what it says, verses 9 through 12. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We work night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct towards you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So Paul's writing to the church at Thessalonica, and he says, You guys remember we were, we were hard working. We weren't a burden to you. If, if you remember in, in many of Paul's journeys, he didn't show up and say, I'm important, feed me, give me a place to live. No, he actually worked. He, would be, he worked as a tent maker, as a side job to provide for himself. So he was not a burden. And then he said, our conduct was holy and righteous and blameless. I honestly can't say that my conduct is always holy and righteous and blameless. I don't know about all of you. But this is what Paul says, and then he says, Like a father with his children, we exhorted you, the believers in Thessalonica, to do what? To walk in a manner worthy of God. That's the charge. That's the calling. As Christians, we have this same calling, this charge on our lives, to walk in a manner worthy of God. Now, that's not easy. I'm not trying to say that it is, but that's what we've been charged to do. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16 says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So holy in our conduct. Not just holy because he made us holy, but holy in the way that we do things. And that word holy literally means to be set apart or to be separate. And so as followers of Jesus, we're called to live set apart lives. Not that we, you know, separate ourselves from the world and we don't interact with anybody else, but the fact that our, our life, our conduct, the words that we say, the things that we do should be different. People should be able to look at us and say, there's something different about him. There's something different about her. 
we should be set apart. And that is a very tall order. The good news is it's not by our own power, but by the power of the Holy Spirit living in us. Our behavior, we know, reflects our Savior. We are ambassadors of Christ, Scripture says. And an ambassador, whether they like it or not, everything they do reflects on the one who sent them. Good and bad. Everything they say, everything they do, how they act, everything represents the one who sent them. And so as ambassadors of Christ, we represent Jesus. And then when we act in a way that is contrary to what God's word says, we still represent him. We just misrepresent him. And so as we we talk about church discipline, this is where it comes into play. When a follower of Jesus misrepresents Jesus, when they show Jesus to be something he is not or someone he is not, when their behavior begins to cause harm to the body or causes people to misunderstand who Jesus is, then it is the responsibility of the church to step in. It is not fun. It is not pleasant. Uh, But we're going to talk today. We've, We've got a few points to walk through and some scripture to read to help us understand why this is necessary for the body of Christ. And the first is this. Discipline is beneficial. Now, kids, you're probably like, no, it's not. It's worthless. I hate it. And maybe many of us are in the same way. It is not, it is not a wonderful thing <clears throat> when you're going through it, but it is beneficial, and that's what Scripture teaches. And throughout Scripture, it equates God's discipline for his children, for us, to the same as a father disciplining his children. And that's what we're going to read in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. It says, It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So a few things that we learned from that. Number one, discipline leads to holiness. We just said, you know, God's standard is be holy like I'm holy. Again, it's a high bar. Discipline leads to that holiness. It's not just to punish someone. It's not just to shame someone. It is to correct someone's behavior so it aligns with God's designs. If you, if you have a child who has a chronic lying problem, they just all the time, they just lie about everything. So you discipline that child. You don't discipline them just to hurt them or cause them pain so they have consequences for their action. You discipline them so their behavior changes, so they stop lying all the time. That's the purpose. Discipline leads to holiness, the scripture says. The goal is, in in the case of a child, is for them to not lie anymore. The goal of discipline in the church is to return someone to living the life that God wanted them to live in the first place and to share in his holiness. The second thing we learned from the scripture <clears throat> is that discipline is not pleasant. By the way, I told the band I had five points. Each point has like four or five points with it, so don't worry. You guys got plenty of time to rest. So the second thing here, discipline is not pleasant. <clears throat> he says it right there. Discipline is painful, not pleasant. And spoiler alert, that is by design. God designed it that way. 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 and 15 says, If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with them, that he may be ashamed. Do not, do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Seems kind of harsh, right? Don't have anything to do with this brother so that they'll be ashamed. That sounds terrible, but it is part of God's design. And, and why this is effective is the same reason why at times in life when somebody is participating in some very destructive behavior, sometimes you have to go to extreme measures for them to stop. If somebody in in your family 
was addicted to drugs and they were going to kill themselves because of this addiction, wouldn't you go to any possible means to get them to stop? You would do anything. Well, shouldn't we treat sin the same way? We've forgotten the severity of sin and the consequences for sin. Shouldn't we be willing to take drastic measures when necessary, not all the time, but when necessary, shouldn't we be willing to take drastic and unpleasant measures to convince people to repent of their sin? I think we should. The third thing we see in this scripture is that discipline yields righteousness. It's not pleasant, but it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And isn't that worth it right there? Isn't that enough? You know, we're all willing to go through painful things for good outcomes. If you've ever gone to the gym, you've experienced that. You know, it's going to hurt, but it's going to lead to good things. Or maybe you've had a difficult conversation with somebody to bring reconciliation. It's uncomfortable. You don't want to do it, but it's a step that needs to be taken. Or maybe, maybe you've gone through a surgery. You've got some kind of pain in your body. Yeah, you got knee pain, so you're going to go get your knee replaced. Surgery is not pleasant. But the outcome, the result of it, can be good. And so sometimes we have to do unpleasant and painful things when we know the outcome is worth it. And in this case, he says, discipline yields righteousness. And then finally, uh, right before this, in verses 6 and 7, we learn that God disciplines those he loves. Verses 6 and 7, it says, And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. The scripture that we read before says that if you're not disciplined by God, then you're an illegitimate child. God disciplines those he loves. So when we in the church, when we look at it and we say, well, we don't do that because we love people. We don't discipline because we love. What scripture says is God disciplines because he loves. So we're essentially saying we know how to love better than God does. When we choose to not do it in the name of love. It's painful, it's uncomfortable, but ultimately, discipline is beneficial. The second thing that we we see in Scripture is that the church disciplines, or the church is the one who administers discipline. Not in every case, but in some cases, the church is the one that administers discipline. So God God sets the standard. He says, "This this is how I want you to live. He's the one that gives us that standard. Then he calls people into community with one another as a church, as a local body. Then he establishes leaders for that local church. And then that church, led by God-appointed leaders, administers the discipline that comes from God. So what we just talked about, God disciplines those he loves. Well, the ones that he uses to discipline is his church. We read this in Matthew 18. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So Jesus says here, Jesus' words, somebody sins against you, go talk to them one-on-one. If they don't listen, take a couple more people with you. Still don't listen, take it to the church. If you, if you make it to that level and they still refuse, you treat them as a Gentile or a tax collector. Which, by the way, let's not forget how Jesus treated Gentiles and tax collectors. He loved them and he hung out with them. He spent time with them. That did not mean that they were part of the family. 1 Corinthians 5.13 says, expel, when it reaches that level, expel the wicked man from among you. 2 Corinthians 2.6 talks about the punishment by the majority. At some point, <clears throat> in some cases, when there is still no repentance, it comes to the level where the church has to take action. When a person in the church sins against others or is living in open and unrepentant sin, it, there is a time that comes when the church has to take action. And we've already talked about why, because that person is misrepresenting 
what it means to be a Christ follower. The word Christian means little Christ. We've talked about that before. We're supposed to represent him. We're supposed to be just like him. And when somebody's not acting that way, action has to be taken. Now, I will say this. Every, every case of discipline in the church is totally different, depending on a billion different factors. So it's not like every, you know, we're going to call everybody up here and we're going to go down your list of sins and tell the whole church. It's not that way. But in certain cases, it does reach that point. And one of the major things we see in this scripture that we just read is, has the person repented? In the vast majority of, of cases in church discipline, a one-on-one encounter or a two-on-one encounter, and that person says, you know what, you're right, I'm sorry, they repent of their sin, and that's it. It doesn't have to go any further according to scripture. In fact, it would be a violation of scripture to take it any further than that. It's only in those cases when somebody refuses to repent that it becomes necessary to take it to the church. Disciplining a brother or sister by the congregation is a way for the church to tell that person that their behavior is not properly representing Jesus. They are not being a a good ambassador of Christ. The third thing we see is that discipline is biblical. And this should be it right here, right? This is enough. If discipline is biblical, then it should be enough. And we don't have time to go through all the scriptures. I think there are still some of the sheets of uh, the scriptures in the lobbies on, on church discipline. There are many, many scriptures specifically related to church discipline. And then if you start to look at other scriptures just related to discipline in general, there's tons of it. Go, look, go read through Proverbs. It's like every other proverb has something about a father disciplining his child or God disciplining his children. Over and over in Scripture, we see discipline as part of life. It is highly biblical for a church to practice discipline when necessary. The problem is, we have a tendency sometimes, when we've come across a Scripture that we just, it it rubs us the wrong way, all right? We read that Scripture and we're like, "Ah, I don't like that. What we do is we try to find a loophole, and we twist it and we say, well, that just applied to that culture, Or that just applies to that specific situation. And we forget that all Scripture is God-breathed and all Scripture is beneficial and all Scripture is for all of us. Now, there are Scriptures, I will say, and, and there are Scriptures that deal with some specific things that don't apply to all times. I'll give you an example. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, Paul talks about women wearing head coverings in the church. All right, I, I think just about everybody's in violation. All right, so, you know, Paul says, you know, you have to wear a head covering in church as, so that you honor your, honor your head, which would be your husband or your father if you're not married. So you have to wear a head covering in church. If you don't wear a head covering or if you shave your head, it is shameful. Okay, so why don't we, you know, instead of providing masks at the door, we provide hats for the women to put on. Well, no, we don't. But there's something we have to understand in this. In that culture at that time, uh, not, to, uh, not to upset any of the, the kiddies, but basically if, if a woman didn't have her head covered, she was saying, I'm available. That, that was what it meant. And so Paul is saying, church isn't the place for that. Church isn't the place to try to find a husband So wear a hat, wear a head covering, cover your head because that's not the place. So in in our modern context, that doesn't mean the same thing. A woman wearing a head covering or not wearing a head covering doesn't mean the same thing, but a woman dressing provocatively does. And if somebody came in here parading up and down the aisles wearing something inappropriate trying to find a husband, yeah, we would say something. All right, you guys got it? So there are cases in Scripture where we look and say, okay, certain aspects of this apply to that culture, but the principle applies to everyone at every time. So when we do have to take culture and other things into account when we interpret Scripture, but there's always a principle to be gleaned from it. And by the way, church discipline isn't really one of those topics. It's just pretty straightforward. It says what it means. And so we cannot look at Scripture and say, well, that only applies to the early church, or that only applies in this situation. 
This applies to all of us. Imagine if I were to give you an assignment, okay, before next Sunday, I need you to write your life story. <clears throat> write down your life story be between now and next Sunday and bring it back. But the catch is I'm just going to give you a post-it note. All right, so you're going to write your life story on a three-by-three three post-it note. You're probably going to be pretty intentional about every word you write on there, right? You're going to really think it through. If, you're going to, if you would spend the time, you would really think it through and say, okay, I have to be really intentional so I only have this much space. John tells us in, in his gospel that if everything about Jesus had been written down, that there wouldn't be enough room on earth to put all the books. And that's just 33 years of Jesus' life on earth. Imagine if God were to write everything down from the beginning of creation until the, the time of the early church, there's no way we could carry that around, even in, our, even in our electronic devices. God was very intentional in what he put in his book. What he wrote on his post-it note, he was very intentional. He didn't write things that weren't only going to apply to one person or one group of people. He wrote things that applied to all people for all times. And so when we look at Scripture and we say, well, that doesn't apply, we can't do that. God was very intentional, and church discipline is biblical. It's right there in the Word, and it sh that should be enough. The fourth thing we see, and this is going to seem redundant, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this anyways, but the fourth thing we see is that discipline is God's design. And that could be the same thing as being biblical, but, but go with me on this. It's His design, not ours. He's the one that designed the process of church discipline. If you stop to think about it, there are probably things in Scripture that you would look at and say, if it were up to me, I would have done that differently. There are some things that God did that we say, why'd you do it that way? Um, chief among them, maybe another way than having your own son murdered to save us all. But that's the way that God chose to do it. Over and over throughout Scripture, there are things that God did that we would say, hmm, I might have done that differently. Discipline may be one of them. But what we have to understand is God's design is often countercultural. It is often unconventional. It might seem unusual. But it's His design. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Basically, he's saying, yeah, you may have done it differently, but my way's better. I know what I'm doing. It's not easy for us to understand this all the time. But we have to realize God knows what he's doing. The other thing we have to realize is not just God's side of it, but we have to understand Satan side of it. You know, if you, were, <clears throat> if you were going through a hike, you know, later today you're going to go on a hike through the woods, and on your hike you come across something under the leaves, and you've, you pick it up, and it's a big, giant book, big, old-looking book with Gothic writing on the front that said, Satan's Book of Tricks. All right, and so you, you're like, man, this, this is interesting, so you probably wouldn't open it up, right? That would be a little weird, but... You decide, I'm going to check it out. So you open it up, and you, you, you look to page one, and you find the oldest trick in the book. What is it? Did God really say? That's the oldest trick in the book for Satan. Did God actually say fill in the blank? That's what he's constantly doing. God says all kinds of things, and then Satan comes along and says, did he really say that? Genesis 3, verse 1 it says, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that God had made. And he, the serpent, said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Did God really say that? And we know the, the result of, of that. Sin entered the world. That's the oldest trick in the book for Satan. He even tried it on Jesus. He failed. But he tried it on Jesus too. But it's a trick that Satan still uses today, speaking in the ears of God's people, 
saying, did God really say that? Did God really mean that? And I believe that happens when it comes to church discipline. It is God's design. But it may not make perfect sense to us all the time. And Satan comes and whispers in our ear, did God really say that? How could that actually work? How does removing someone from the church actually restore them to the church? That doesn't make sense. Did God really say that? Satan knows what he's doing. And our response when that, those questions come and he whispers in our ear, our, our response a lot of times is to, to tweak things, to change things, to make them more cult- culturally appropriate, to make things that align with conventional wisdom, to, to make things appeal to the masses. Because Satan says, did God really say that? He did really say that. We don't have the right to change it. It may not make sense, but we don't have the right to change it. Just like I don't have the right to go up to the Mona Lisa and, you know, add some little things to it because I don't like it. I'm not the artist. I don't have the right to change it. God is the artist. He painted the painting. We can't add little trees and happy faces on it because we don't like the way it looks. It's God's design. Church discipline is God's design. The final thing we see in the, script, in the scriptures is the goal of discipline is restoration. The purpose of it all, as, as harsh as it may seem, to take something before the whole church, to expel somebody from a church, seems so harsh, but the whole purpose of it is restoration. Galatians 6.1 it says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. The goal of discipline throughout Scripture, whether it's discipline carried out by God himself on an individual, whether it's discipline from a, a parent to a child, whether it's discipline from a church to a church member, the purpose is restoration. First of all, restoration to God. And when we're saved, it says that we, we were slaves to sin and we become reconciled to God th- through Jesus' sacrifice and through the faith that we have in him. But after that takes place, it is still possible for us to put a wall up. It is possible for us to, to damage that relationship. We can't lose our salvation. There's not anything we're going to do where God's going to say, never mind. You cross the line, but we are able to stray away and to put a barrier between ourselves and God. Discipline is seeking to restore that relationship. As, as difficult as it is, as painful as it might be, the purpose is to bring that person back into a right relationship with God. Secondly, it's restoration to the church. We want people to come back into a right relationship to God, but when we when somebody is restored to a right relationship with God, it also allows them to be restored to the church as a whole, to be a, an active member and participating member of the church. Because our sin doesn't just create a divide between us and God, it, it creates a divide between us and others, other Christians. Oftentimes people remove themselves and, and maybe you've experienced that before in church where somebody's caught in a sin and before the church can do anything about it, they just say, I'm out of here. I don't want to deal with this. I'm gone. Sometimes people even remain active in the church, but there's a barrier. There's something there and they know, people know that there's something there. Second Corinthians 2, Paul says, sin causes pain to the whole church. When there's sin... In the church, not only does it, is it like yeast that just grows and gets out of control, but it also brings pain to the whole church. Discipline seeks to restore that relationship, bring that person back into a right relationship with God and a right relationship with the church. And again, I know you're saying, well, how does kicking someone out of church bring them back into right relationship with the church? When you get some time, Look up, go, go online and look up stories of, of church discipline. You'd be amazed at the stories 
of people who went through crazy things and, and were removed from their church. I, I read one the other day about a woman who was unfaithful to her husband on multiple occasions. And so finally the church stepped in and said, you are misrepresenting Christ in the way you're living your life. And they, the church voted and removed her. She left. Ten years later, like two or three more marriages and divorces, and she started going to a different church And through going back to that church, she felt that tug of the Holy Spirit. And and who did she call? She called the, the elder and his wife who first came to her house and said, we're gonna be having a vote to remove you from the church. That's who she called. And she came, she didn't rejoin the church because she had moved, but she came back and stood before the church and said, I was wrong. I sinned against God and I sinned against all of you and I'm sorry and she repented and the relationship was restored 10 years later. I mean, only God can do that. There are so many stories that seem so counterintuitive where God uses an uncomfortable process to bring people back together in the church. So it restores a relationship with God to the church and to individuals. In the case of most sin, there's uh, many times there's two parties involved. Somebody sinned against somebody else. Somebody did something against somebody else. And the purpose of discipline, again, is to bring those people to restore that relationship back together. The, the purpose and the goal of any type of discipline is to restore that person to a right relationship to God and to others. By the way, in case you were wondering, God can, kill, can heal even the most messed up relationships, the most broken, messed up relationship God can heal. In his infinite wisdom, he designed the process of discipline to bring restoration, to mend broken relationships. Doesn't mean we have to like it. Doesn't mean it has to be pleasant. But we don't have the right to to change it, and we don't have the right to ignore it. God's desire is to have a pure church. He's, his desire is for his people to represent Christ properly, to show the world who he is. And when we come into a, a church body like this, we come under the authority of the leader, the leadership that God has established, and God's church has the responsibility to uphold his word. When, when all those things take place, discipline sometimes becomes necessary. Now, if you have a church that doesn't care to follow the word or you have a a church full of people who don't care about submitting to leadership as Scripture teaches, then it's not going to work. But when all those things come together, God works miracles through the discipline process. Sometimes quickly, sometimes it's years and years down the road. The most loving thing we can do as a church is to act according to God's word. Even when it's hard, even when it hurts, We know scripture says God is love. So to to open up God's word and say that's not loving would be an oxymoron because God is love. Everything he has determined is an expression of his love. And his desire is to see people restored. Scripture says he's willing to leave the 99 to go after the one. He wants people to be restored. And sometimes what it takes for someone to be restored is a little uncomfortable. And, and maybe you've experienced that in your own life. Maybe you've been through that rebellious phase where it took a little more than a, a nudge to get you to, to come back. Sometimes restoring becomes uncomfortable, but it's the most loving thing we can do when we operate according to God's word. Church discipline is, is again, it's not pleasant, it's not fun, but it's part of living together in a community with one another, and it's a way of knowing, that, you know what, we're all on the same team. We're all working together. We all have a common goal to see people come to faith in Christ and to, to present to him a church that's pure. And so when all that takes place, we just, we just want to follow what God's word says. Living in, in community with, with other people gets messy. Somebody told me one time church ministry would be easy if it weren't for the people. 
It also wouldn't be necessary, but living in community with other people gets messy. But that's part of the beauty of it. We, we jump into the mess with each other, and we help each other out of it, and we carry each other's burdens, and we work through all these things together so that we can be more Christ-like. That's the purpose. Let's pray together. And Lord, we just, we just love you. We thank you for your word. Even the parts of it that we sometimes don't understand, the things that, that are challenging, that hurt, that don't make sense sometimes, Lord, we trust that your word is true and that it is right. And we just want to follow it. Even when it means stepping out of our comfort zones, even when it means doing things that are uncomfortable or unpleasant, because we trust that your plan and your design is right. Lord, you sent your son, your son, you sent your son to die for our sins. Shouldn't we be willing to do some uncomfortable things to present you a bride that is pure? So Lord, I pray that you would help us as a church to remain focused on your word, even when it's hard. Lord, I pray for those in this room right now and those listening and watching online. Lord, if anyone here has not entered into a relationship with Jesus by faith, Lord, I pray that today would be the day that they would trust him. I know a, a message on discipline is not a a great time for an invitation. But I have a feeling there's people out there who are looking for the type of community that will love them enough to leave the 99 and come after them to do hard things, to do difficult things, to help them follow Jesus. So Lord, I pray if there's anyone here today that doesn't know Jesus, that as we sing today, they'd be willing to come and give their life to him. Lord, if there's anyone here that's looking for a church family that is not perfect, but is willing to go through the mess together, Lord, and they want to be part of that imperfect community that is striving to be like Jesus, Lord, I pray that they would come today and join us on this journey. Lord, be with us as we walk through our everyday life. Help us to be holy just like you are through the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, because we have no power of our own to live the life you've called us to live. But we have the same power living in us that raised Jesus from the dead. So Lord, help us to live the life that you've called us to live through the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.